Welcome to this week's edition of the Baylow Report. I'm Jane Baylow. Our guest this week is a, almost like a repeat, but not really, uh, Wayne Ganaway, who is the executive director of the Rochester History Center. And uh, something has changed since the last time we talked. We, were, we went through this great list of things you were planning to do, including the farmhouse out there at the History Center and looking at the caves, and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and then you got a budget cut. Yes, Jane, that's right, that's right. Um, we, we do have a, a full slate. We, we have a, a, a lot of things to accomplish when it comes to sharing the history of Olmstead County with the residents of Olmstead County. But yes, the, the county commissioners um, uh, last, late last year um, uh, notified us that um, there was a cut coming and they were going to keep us whole for 2021, our budget whole that is for 2021 using reserves and then the following year there would be a, a, a $50,000 cut which is amounts to almost 20% of the county's allocation to us and 10% of our budget. So it's significant um, and it will definitely have an impact. Let's uh, talk about the History Center and how it fits with the Preservation Commission that the city has. Mm -hmm. What does the Preservation Committee do? Yeah, we have a seat on the Historic Preservation Commission, Rochester's Commission. Um, we, uh, but that, that's our only specific uh, tie to the Historic Preservation Commission. We share um, a full, an overarching goal though, however, to preserve preserve the the heritage um, of the of the city of Rochester and to ensure that future generations can be inspired by and learn from the past, which is essential to being a good citizen, I would argue. Okay. And uh, is the Preservation Commission doing that? Oh, yeah, I think they are. Um, you know, it, every preservation, historic preservation commission, now once again, we are separate from the preservation commission, um, important to keep that in mind. Um, but every historic preservation commission is different in any city in the state or the nation. And they all, they all are emblematic or, or illustrative of their particular community. And so some, like, St. Paul's Historic Preservation Commission um, has, an, has established historic preservation districts. And as I understand it, Rochester's is very different because it, there is a smaller histor uh, historic building stock. Um, but essentially they are guided by um, certified local government guidelines that um, they uh, follow um, as their sort of basic uh, um, approach to historic preservation. So um, every, every one of them is different, and, um, but I believe from, from what I know that the Rochester Historic Preservation Commission um, is, is doing their job. Okay, now if you were to describe the mission of the History Center, would you repeat that for us, please? Yes, our mission is to uh, show that to all of the residents of Olmstead County how history, understanding our past, informs our present and gives us a better understanding of our future as well. And we do this through exhibits, interpretive programs, educational programs, and historic buildings and um, landscapes. And that's essentially our mission, is to show how the past is connected and informs the present and future. 
Now, you mentioned the last time we spoke, it was a month, month or a month and a half ago, that you had some capital improvements that you're looking at making. And these were the farmhouse out on the campus. Mm -hmm. And uh, what exactly are you looking to spend on these improvements? Yeah, uh, just to um, um, review a bit about that. Yeah, so the George Stoppel Farmstead is um, the earliest in, intact farmstead in Olmstead County. And it's comprised of three historic buildings and several historic caves. And the, the caves speak in a way that no other site can in our county and possibly our region, speak to the history of agriculture beginning in the Minnesota Territory and also to the, the stories of immigration to Minnesota, um, beginning in the Minnesota Territory, so the 1850s. And so what we are going to do, because these buildings have a story to tell, but in order to tell that story, they have to be restored. So we are um, going to be raising uh, funds to do that. And Depending on the scope of the, the overall project, it would probably be about 2.5 million, which sounds like a lot, but in order to do it properly, to respect the incredible uh, skill of these stonemasons, of these carpenters, um, we need to do it properly. And that's why the price tag is at 2.5 million around, around that. But Jane, we will be um, going, we've applied for a, a large legacy grant. Um, that's the, uh, the grant that was the, the funds that were created through the uh, constitutional amendment. And um, the first building that were, we applied for was the smokehouse, which is a very rare building and um, it really has no other, there's really no other building like it, perhaps in Minnesota. It's so rare. And so it's going to cost about $350,000 to restore it. And we've applied for about 240 from 240,000 from the uh, legacy funds. That's a competitive grant, so it's not a slam dunk. But if we get it, then we would begin that construction work um, next year. And then it must be part of a larger plan, right? Exactly, exactly. Okay, so after the smokehouse. By the way, is that being used as a smokehouse? Not currently. I don't know when the last time it was used as a smokehouse was, um, but it is a, a pretty incredible uh, type of smokehouse. Smoke, most smokehouses from the 1850s, 60s, and 70s were very simple log cabins or, or brick structures, and usually just one, one story, just simply to do, uh, you're smoking your meats, right? But this one is quite different. It's two stories. It's got a two-story smoking chamber. Um, it also was where the hired hands lived on the second floor. So George Stoppel would help young German men emigrate to Minnesota, and then they would work for him on his farm and they'd live in that, that smokehouse building. Um, but also it straddles, Jane, it straddles an entrance to a 60 foot deep cave. So this is a really unusual building. Um, but we won't actually be smoking meat in it, but we'll be telling the stories of, of how that worked. So people will be able to learn you know, how did they preserve food back in the 1850s and 60s before they had refrigeration? Well, the, caves, the caves should have been cold. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So on the one hand, they used fire and smoke to preserve the meat in the, in the smoke chamber. And then for the vegetables, fruit, and, and other um, uh, produce like that, they would put into the cave where the temperature is 
pretty much an even 50 degrees or 55 degrees all year round. Uh -huh. So it's a really amazing uh, building that deserves a greater spotlight and appreciation. And when do you find out about this legacy grant? In January of next year. So fingers crossed, um, it's, it would be a huge uh, benefit to the History Center and to the community. Because the smokehouse is in urgent need of stabilization. It, it's built into the side of a hill, and that hill, as hills will tend to do, is pushing back. And it's the, the ground from the hill is kind of pushing the foundation out and kind of making it close to failing. So it is really urgent that the smokehouse uh, get attention soon. And okay, then let's finish the plan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there are then three or two other buildings. There's the barn, everyone knows the barn. It's a huge bank barn um, built probably in the 1870s. And then the stone house, which was built in the 1860s. And we haven't decided yet which building will come next after the smokehouse. Um, probably the barn, because that is also has some urgent needs, like um, the cedar shingle roofing needs to be replaced and so on. Um, but that would happen in 2020, Four, and then the final building would be in 2026 because of the way that the application process works for the large legacy grants. Okay, and when the people came over and started the Stopple Farm, where did they come from? They came from a, um, a kingdom, believe it or not. It's the, it was the kingdom of Württemberg in southwest, what is now uh, southwest Germany. And that was um, in the, they were came of age in the 1830s and 40s when revolution was rippling across France, Germany, and Switzerland, and, and throughout Europe. And so George Stoppel and his brother Franz Joseph, who was a little bit older, Imagine, you know, trying to figure out what you're going to do with your life when everything's being turned upside down by revolution. And it was. Um, and they, along with many thousands of other um, Europeans, came over to the United States looking for a, a better life. And the Sable Farm was where our group stopped, right? That that's correct, yeah, yeah, that's right. They started, they arrived in what would later become Ellis Island, but at the time, Ellis Island had not yet been created. Oh. Um, and they spent a little bit of time in New York State, but they spent quite a bit of time in Cincinnati, Ohio. That's where they became citizens, where they married uh, their German uh, wives and had started their families. But in... 1855, a, um, a mayor elect or a mayor, a guy who was running for mayor under the Know Nothing Party started using anti German immigrant rhetoric and he created a riot directed against the German immigrants of that community. And um, it was violent. There was a lot of violence towards these German immigrants. And the next year, Franz Joseph and his brother George and their families loaded up their oxen pulled wagon and made the trek to Minnesota. At which time I think a lot of the Norwegian and the Middle European countries were migrating up into northern Minnesota. You're right, yeah, exactly. It was, Minnesota was, um, sort of a, a, a destination for immigrants. Yeah. Um, and partly because of the lands that were expected to be uh, uh, taken from the Native Americans through uh, various treaties. Um, and in fact, George Stoppel um, and his brother both, they bought their land, not from you know a private resident, but from the United States government. 
which is really interesting to think about that. So the land that the History Center is on came from the Native Americans to the federal government to the Stopples. And there's even a certificate of ownership in the Bureau of Land Management that you can look up and look at that states that George Stoppel bought 160 acres from the United States government. I find that very poignant. It is. Huh. Very interesting. All right, now how are you gonna get the money? Well. Yeah, you've applied for a legacy grant, right. which you'll find out next year. Right. In January. And then you'll apply for another one for 2022? Four. 2024, yeah. Okay. And then, yeah, and, and of course, the legacy grants won't be adequate to do to, to, no. to the job. So we will, and we're, we're really looking closely at figuring out how are we going to um, raise the additional funds. Um, but we're, what excites me about it, Jane, and excites our board of directors is that we are coming up to our 100th anniversary as a county historical society. And was, that will be when? That'll be in uh, 2026. Okay. Because it was established by Bert Eaton in 1926. And we find that to be an incredible milestone of history. Um, and so I'm energized by it and the board is energized by it and we think that we will be able to um, energize and um, work with funders both um, in public funding but also in uh, philanthropic uh, funding and private donors as well. We don't have a game plan yet but we are creating one. Do you have adequate computers for logging in gifts? That is so important, Jane. Yeah, stewardship of gifts is critical, both for keeping your books, your accounting transparent, um, and honoring the, the intent of donors, um, but also just so that you can thank your donors in a timely way, in the appropriate way. So we are, strengthening our, um, our administrative capacity to do that. Um, we haven't put the pieces quite in place yet, but we will be doing that before uh, January. And you've got money to do that? Yes, we do have, uh, we're able to do some of the, the, the administrative pieces. There's great new software that helps even small organizations do a good job in that stewardship. Um, other parts of it are going to be a little more challenging, particularly with the budget cut. Um, but we're determined to figure out how to do it so we can um, show potential funders and, and private donors that we're serious, we're capable of this, and it's going to happen. Good. Okay. Let's talk about your immediate future. What's going on right now? Well, with the air getting a little more crisp as the leaves start to turn golden brown and, and fall from the trees, and you, as you're walking across campus here, you hear the crunch, crunch, crunch. Well, for a lot of people, that means Halloween. And after last year, when Halloween was pretty much shut down by COVID, we decided we wanted to celebrate Halloween this year with our third annual Creepy Doll Contest. Creep, uh, creepy Doll. Creepy Doll Contest. And Jane, that's where we go through our museum collections over the last hundred years, almost hundred years. People from across the county have donated dolls, dolls that were once loved um, and tell us a lot about life in Olmstead County. But to our modern eyes, um, our 21st century eyes and sensibilities, these dolls can look a little bit, well, creepy. So um, we decided to choose nine dolls from our collections and then put them out on social media, Facebook, Instagram, and have uh, people vote for which they think is the creepiest. So, 
And we are going to announce the winner at our Creepy Doll cocktail party, which is held this Saturday at the castle, which what better building to have a Halloween ball than the castle. I love that building. That's the uh, 23rd. That's the 23rd. Of, of October. So when That's pe right. people are viewing this later, they'll know the results by now. But yep. so right now is when people are voting, right? That's right. That's right. People when are, are you counting the votes? We're counting the votes as they come in. And then we will crown or coronate the uh, lucky doll winner. Um, who then gets the glory for a whole year back in the museum collections <laughs> vault um, about their, uh, their reign as the most creepiest doll. Um, and I have, Jane, I have last year's doll if you'd like to meet. We'd like to see it. Great. I don't know what a creepy doll looks like. Well, you're about to find out, Jane. And, and because we are a museum, we use... Um, we want to take care of, because once again, these are um, museum collection items. So we use special gloves um, so that the oil on my hands doesn't get onto the, the dolls. So, you know, we're serious about our business. Are you still accepting dolls for your collection? Oh, yeah, we, we definitely accept dolls. Yep. Okay. This is, if I can introduce you to... Mrs. Danvers. Mrs. Danvers won the most votes from our Creepy Doll, uh, creepy doll Contest. She doesn't look creepy. Well, you she know, looks... I think in a various lights, but also, Jane, um, her head comes off. So you can look inside and see if she's actually got any brains in there or not. But, um, but yeah, it's... Um, you know what, and it's always important to remember too that we have fun with this and, and it's a great way to get, but it's, the, the important message is it's, it's a great way to get people connected with their history. And here's a story to illustrate. Um, I was talking to, with a young woman the other day and she said she saw the Creepy Doll Contest and it made her think of her grandmother's doll that she gave to her granddaughter the woman I was speaking to, and it brought her back to that personal relationship with her grandmother and all of the positive associations that she has with it. And that's what history is about. It's the power of those associations. And those are generally can be really positive things because it, it makes us feel better about our lives um, knowing that people who came before us were resilient, they were able to persist through challenges, and they passed on lessons to us. Um, and so, Mrs. Danvers here, her message as she is ready to give up her crown to the next winner is she wants to see more history, and remember, there is power in history. And that's true. That is true, I believe that firmly. But it needs Financial support. But it needs financial support. And, you know, here's the other interesting thing, Jan, and Mrs. Danvers um, reminded me to share this with you, is that going back to 1928, the Minnesota State Legislature uh, passed a law allowing counties to provide public funds to county historical societies. Now, they didn't mandate it, just to be clear, it wasn't required, but they went out of their way to specifically allow that. And because they recognized they had seen history being made. Just think of it, the, the settlement of the prairie, the settlement of the Minnesota Territory, the Civil War, the 1918 pandemic, World War I, in 1920, Eight, those state legislators could see that history was not just a, a, a piece of entertainment. It was critical to being a good citizen. And that was true for Thomas Jefferson, as we talked about last time we, t we visited. And it's true for us today here in Olmstead County. We are better citizens by understanding our local and regional history. Yes. 
and uh, the males play a very important part of it. That's right, and the Mayo brothers, they knew that too, and, and uh, Dr. Plummer understood the humanities were critical for doctors. Um, it wasn't just about science. There was a, an appreciation of the humanities, which history is a part of, that Dr. Plummer and Dr. Charlie and Dr. Will, they recognized and valued the humanities and civic engagement. That's why they helped invest in various uh, theater, symphonies. Um, they knew that it attracted talent, which it still does today, and it makes for better citizens and a better community. The past tells us that, and if we don't learn from those lessons, we're gonna have to relearn them in the future, without a doubt. Yeah. Okay, let's finish the contest uh, information. Yeah. And how many votes have you had so far? Well, we are upwards to, I believe, last week we were at probably around 200 votes spread around to the various nine contestants. I don't know who's in the lead. And, and I don't know in the, who's in the lead, but um, I do know that um, we've got some great contestants. And the steampunk is a theme that we're, we're um, adding to the contest. So at the, at the cocktail party, you can dress up in a steampunk outfit, Jane. Oh, I want to see you at the at our cocktail party in a steampunk outfit. Are these from <laughs> your collection now? Yeah, those are from our collection. And we took them um, in our museum, artfully uh, uh, displayed. And um, each of these dolls will be at the cocktail party on Saturday. And visitors, cocktail party uh, uh, attendees will be able to interact with the dolls and um, have a great time with them. Isn't that fun? That's one of my favorites. <laughs> <laughs> it's getting creepy though. Yeah, yeah. And there she is, Mrs. Danvers, 2020 winner. Oh my. Okay. That's for Saturday night. Saturday night, yep. Okay. And you're announcing the winner on Friday? No, we'll announce it at the cocktail party on Saturday night. Okay. And then we'll put it out on social media and, thereafter. And where is the castle? The castle is right on uh, South Broad, or on Broadway, on the edge of downtown, or in downtown. Oh, the one downtown. Yep, the one downtown. That's the old armory. Okay. Yeah, that's it, where your party is. That's where our party is, yep. And it costs money to go? Yep, you can get tickets on our website, uh, olmsteadhistory.com, and um, you can even get a, a, a VIP uh, edition, which includes a, a whiskey tumbler and a special booklet that has all the fine dolls and a write-up on them. It's, it's quite uh, suitable for framing. Okay. <laughs> All right, well, you put the doll away. Yes. I'll uh, ask you a little bit about your history again because sure. it was so interesting that you, your last job, after being a Winona native, right? Mm -hmm. Your last job was in the state of Virginia. That's correct, yep. I worked, Jane, at the uh, Thomas but, Jefferson's Poplar Forest in Lynchburg, Virginia, and that was Mr. Jefferson's other yeah. plantation and his private retreat house. Okay, so it's more than Camp David. Yeah, it's it's more than Camp David. Oh yeah, oh yeah. There's a lot of a lot of United States history at Poplar Forest. Like, well, uh, it's part of it is the architecture of Jefferson, which inspired uh, the University of Virginia and many other neoclassical uh, public architecture that we see, including the White House. However, the other part that we have to remember, Jane, is, and, um, and, and it's okay to say this, is that Thomas Jefferson enslaved about 100 men, women, and children to, run, to harvest and cultivate his tobacco. And 
each one of those men, women, and children, those African-American uh, um, enslaved people, had incredible stories to tell. And so at Poplar Forest, in addition to telling the incredible story of Thomas Jefferson, they also tell the incredible stories of the enslaved community. And they're, they're amazing stories, uh, stories of perseverance and resilience. Are they in books? They are now. Um, because of archaeology, the incredible work of, of archaeology over the last 50 years, um, the story of those enslaved people is being uh, written about in books. You're right. Okay. And you can buy those in the library? Yes, you can, actually. Um, there are, um, I think Minnesota should probably have more books about um, the founder, founding of our nation. Um, I think Minnesotans should read more about the founding of our nation, including how most of the founders were slave owners and understand what that meant, um, what that meant to the founding of our country. But, um, you know, we're all inextricably linked to the founding of our nation. Um, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And um, I think that what, that's what makes us unique. And that we're still working on it. We're st right. it that's right, that's right. We are still working on it. And I think that's the, the brilliance of the Declaration of Independence. The Declaration of Independence created that perfect idea, which we have not attained, but we are continually striving for. Okay. All right. Uh, now you have some other things coming up at the History Center in the next couple of months? Yes, one of the favorite um, Yuletide traditions in Rochester is going to visit Mayowood and seeing the Christmas decorations. Well, after a year of, more than a year of being closed due to the pandemic, Mayowood is open now and the decorations are gonna be in the house for Christmas tours and we are thrilled to be welcoming back the public and uh, taking them through the house to see the, the Christmas decorations. The theme this year, Jane, is putting on the Ritz. Um, and so we're partnering with local businesses, but also some nonprofits, uh, Rochester Art Center, uh, Civic Theater, and the 125 Live will also be decorating this year, which I'm really pleased with. And so, yeah, we can't wait to have the public uh, Rochester folks back in Mailwood Mansion. So will you have uh, times when people can come or do they set their own for the different units? Yes, um, we have, they can go to our website and get tickets online. It's really easy to do and uh, we're requiring re reservations because it's been so power, uh, popular in the past. So um, people go to our website, reserve their tickets, and um, then at, when their ticket time comes, they can drive right up to Mayowood Mansion. And when do they start? The Christmas tours start at the beginning of November. Okay. Wow. That's not very far away. No, it's not. <laughs> We've got a lot of work to do. Yeah. All right. And then what else? Well, then we, are, we, we also have our Zoom talks, our Zoom history talks, and um, we've got some really great ones coming up. Um, we've got a, a nationally known photographer for National Geographic. He did a photo shoot of Civil War battlefields um, in Virginia, in fact, and he's going to be, he's now a resident of Rochester, and he's going to be giving a um, slideshow and talk about his work as a photographer and specifically the Civil War Battlefield Photography Project for the National Geographic. So that's gonna be a great, uh, great uh, conversation. We also have uh, Dr. Paul Scanlon wrote that great book about Rochester history. And he's going to be giving a talk as well, which uh, so happy to have Dr. Scanlon in on the history scene. He's a great resource. Um, Rochester's lucky to have him and his book. 
All right, what else? These are both on Zoom. These are both going to be Zoom, and I'll have check our website. They may also be available in, in person, too, but it'll all be at homesteadhistory.com. People can learn all the details. Okay. And that'll pretty much bring us to the end of the year where we then get ready for 2022. And your legacy grant. And the legacy grant, that's right. I'll have... Uh, Who I'll, makes a decision on that? They have a state committee um, up in St. Paul, and I'm not sure who's on the committee. <laughs> um, and uh, hopefully they're... Uh, I'm sure they're upstanding uh, citizens and historians and practitioners. So I'm confident they'll... They'll see our project as... as uh, um, Is there anyone from southern Minnesota on that committee? Gosh, you don't a, know. I don't know, Jane. You I, gotta find out. I gotta find that out, <laughs> right. Yep. Okay, all right. So let's talk about your budget for next year. Okay. Are you going to have to let some people go? We are trying not to. Um, yeah, so it's a $50,000 cut, and what we are trying to do is move people around. Um, if there is a, a, one person is going to be retiring, we're going to have one of our existing staff do their work. So, um, so we're, we, we will probably have to be raising membership costs and admission fees. Um, I hope we don't have to do more than that, um, but there will definitely have to be some changes. Yeah. yeah. All right. We want to thank you, Wayne, very much. Ganaway from uh, the Olmsted County History Center and for sharing all this information with us because uh, history is important and if we don't learn from our history, then we have to start all over. And, uh, and we as, do so often, don't we, Jane? Yeah, as we said. And so we thank you for being our guest again and wish you luck with your creepiest stall contest and your party. And uh, we'll look forward to 2022 and hope you're successful with the Legacy Graham. Thank you, Jane. Thank you so much. And thank you, our viewers, for your interest in Rochester, Olmsted County, and the Olmsted County History Center. And we'll be back next week, same time, same channel. In the meantime, have a very good week and a very good night.